Welcome to the 26th meeting of, in 2023 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. I'd like to remind everyone present to please switch their mobile phones to silent. The first item of business is to decide whether to take items 6, 7, 8 and 9 in private. Is the committee content to take these items in private? Yes, Under agenda item number 2, we, can, we are taking evidence from George Adam, MSP, the Minister for Parliamentary Business. This is one of our regular sessions with the Minister on the Scottish Government's work relevant to this committee. The Minister is accompanied by three Scottish Government officials, uh, Steve McGregor, the Head of Parliament and Legislation Unit, Rachel Rayner, the Deputy Legislation Coordinator in the Scottish Government Legal Directorate, and Greg Walker, the Retained EU Law Act Management Lead. May, may I welcome you all to the meeting this morning. So first of all, I meant the, the attendees not to worry about the, the turning on the microphone, because that would be happening uh, automatically by broadcasting. So first I'd like to invite the Minister to make any opening remarks. Thank you, convener, and good morning to everyone in the committee. Uh, as a former member of the committee, I'm only too aware of the importance of this committee in scrutinising legislation. When we met in February, we were preparing ourselves, both in Scottish Government and in the Parliament, to deal with the measures in the UK Government's retained EU law bill, which we had anticipated would give rise to high volume of uh, subordinate legislation. The final act means that the volumes will not reach the scale that we expected. Nonetheless, ministers need to be assured that devolved provisions are appropriate and officials will continue to appraise the committee of expected future volumes to assist you in managing your own business. Whilst retained EU law implementation has not been as first expected, the Parliament continues to process a significant amount of legislation and I would like to record my thanks to the committee and its officials for the constructive manner in which we continue to work with each other uh, during very extremely busy and challenging legislative programme. The Government continues to deliver on its commitment to deliver more SLC bills, Scottish Law Committee, uh, Commission bills, and I'm pleased uh, to note that this committee has been able to lead scrutiny on two bills this session so far, with stage one of the Trust and Successions Bill this week. It is my hope that this continues, and as you know, our programme for government confirmed that the next uh, Scottish Law Commission bills for introduction will be jud judicial factors, and it is the government's expectation it will be suitable for allocation to this committee. We remain committed to continue continuing to reduce, uh, reduce the backlog of published reports, uh, and by the next parliamentary session, we should have addressed the backlog and be focused on recently published reports. As the committee knows, I take the quality of instruments that we lay very seriously, and it is important that there are few errors as possible. Therefore, I am pleased in the last quarter, no instruments have been reported on serious grounds. I continue to value the close working relationship I have sought to build with this committee, and hope that continues in the future. And I look forward to hearing from everyone on the committee today, and I'm happy to take any questions. Otherwise, I'll go now. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Minister. Nice try. Um, so just to, to open um, the, the session, um, as you, you're aware that the, uh, the committee uh, does a, a very good job, uh, and I'll say that on behalf of all colleagues, uh, with regards to the scrutiny of the SSIs and uh, the Scottish Government, uh, have certainly improved the, the quality of the, the drafting of the SSIs. Uh, as you are very much aware, Minister, that the, uh, we don't identify many issues with them, so I think well, clearly there has been a lot of hard work undertaken there. Uh, but we do still find some errors in the, in the drafting of the SSIs. Uh, can you uh, tell the Committee can, what uh, work uh, that, that you and your colleagues are doing just to, to ensure that the, the drafting errors are reduced? Well, one of the things is, as you quite rightly say, convener, is uh, we're in a good place where there hasn't been that many errors. But on the whole, we, we don't just sit back and lessen, rest in our laurels. We need to continue to have that level of excellence and make sure that you do get everything uh, accurately. Uh, constantly how it works is we tend to make sure that everybody that's involved in the process uh, makes sure that everything's in the correct place and uh, position before it comes to yourself. And it's important for us... I would much rather be in a position where you get everything accurately right from the beginning rather than it be, be an idea that there has been some kind of mistakes. Now and again, because some things are so technical, there will be issues. But on the whole, we kind of try to kind of make sure that doesn't happen. But on this, I'll possibly bring in Rachel at this stage just to give you, just to put your mind at ease and tell you the exact process that we go through. Um, 
So, you know, from um, an SGLD perspective, take quality assurance um, very seriously, and that that's built into really two stages. Firstly, as part of the drafting process, um, so considering and discussing points and raising issues as they arise and dealing with them then. And then secondly, once the instrument is um, prepared, there are checks of that instrument um, within the teams working on it, but then there's also a further check um, by a lawyer who's um, not been involved in it and who can bring that fresh pair of eyes um, to, to see things that maybe other people wouldn't. Um, so I, we think that does provide robust, um, robust quality assurance process, but we are always looking at... Um, Looking at DPLRC reports, are there things we can learn? Are there, is there anything we need to put in place? Do we need to up, update guidance to make sure that points are addressed? Um, as you've seen, where issues do arise, um, there was a particular issue regarding um, a couple of social security instruments. Um, there, a thorough lessons learned exercise has been carried out both by policy colleagues and also SGLD um, to look at, look at the quality of assurance process across across the piece and make sure that you know the suitable guidance <coughs> for staff both you know, in developing policy as well as on the drafting side and um, some of the outcome of that is that there's going to be secondary legislation awareness sessions delivered for social security um, staff on a regular basis not just as a one-off as a continuing process okay no thank you just before I hand over to Mercedes Vialba so just on that particular process um, do you have, for talking sake, maybe two or three years, maybe new people come into the department and then yeah. others move on? Uh, so yes, we have, we have a, um, a learning and development programme for SSIs, both in terms of training new people and coaching them and supporting them in drafting, um, but also then providing refresher and ongoing training um, for lawyers, um, as you've seen this year, you know, the, rule, the Rule Act has come in. That's going to make some changes, so we need to make sure everybody's aware of it. So, yeah, it's a continuous process. Okay, okay. well, thank you. Um, Mercedes Falba. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, yeah, following on the theme of scrutiny of instruments, I wanted to ask a question in relation to information sharing. Um, the committees recently considered and reported instruments which have been linked to UK-wide changes, um, such as instruments relating to public sector pension schemes following the McLeod judgment and council tax reductions following UK-wide changes to universal credit. So I'd like to ask what processes are in place to monitor changes in the UK Parliament and um, any processes to work with the UK government to share information in those sorts of examples. Well, the answer to that, and I welcome you to the committee because I think it's the first thing I've seen you uh, at this committee, uh, Mr. Yapbelver. But uh, one of the things that uh, we've found is, out at official level, officials from the Scottish Government and the UK Government meet each other on a regular basis, and they've got that opportunity to be able to kind of share information and uh, ensure that we try and make things work. But one of the things we need to be uh, aware of is the fact that it is UK uh, legislation a lot of the time that we're dealing with, and or it's UK, it's coming from the UK Parliament, so it is theirs to actually deal with. So uh, we need to find a way that A, we, and I'm trying to make this in a non-political point of view because my job is basically the process of making everything work here, but A, that they remember we're here and we equally have our processes that we need to actually deal with, and uh, B, making sure that uh, the communication between official level and myself at ministerial level with counterparts is there as well. Now, we try to make that work. It doesn't always work, and I think part of the reason is because, uh, you know, Various. If, I'm in, if I was sitting here from the UK government's perspective, I'd be saying we've got a parliament in Westminster that we have to go through their processes, and uh, therefore, just like, and we we're saying at the side, well, yes, but equally this affects us, so therefore we need to actually have the opportunity to have the time to go through our own processes as well. So on the whole, we tend to work very well together, 
Does that mean that there's actually some hiccups along the way? Yes, there can be, uh, mainly because you're dealing with things that there might be a situation where they don't think there is actually a, a, a Scottish element to it or something that affects the Scottish Government and it will be our officials that will maybe say to them that, well, you know, we need to look at this and then there might be a bit of debate on that issue as well. But on the detail, I think, uh, Stephen, uh, possibly if you can maybe give some further detail on that as well. Yeah, I would agree with everything the Minister said there. We spend quite a lot of time at official level engaging with our counterparts in the UK government to make sure they understand um, our needs in terms of understanding what legislation is bringing forward and the Scottish Parliament's needs in terms of timescales for scrutiny, whether that's in relation to retained EU law, LCMs or Scottish statutory instruments. I think in the specific case of the council tax regulations over the summer, um, I think UK local authorities have got the ability to make changes uh, midway through the year without legislation, and we don't have that provision in Scotland. So there's some follow-up work taking place now to make sure that uh, UK government understands that, so they're making changes in the future. They let us know early enough that we're able to prepare our legislation and give the Scottish Parliament time to scrutinise it. I don't know if Greg, can I add with regards to your experience with retained EU law? Um, thank you. Um, as the Minister alluded to in the opening statement, we're no longer looking at volumes of Rural Act instruments, but nonetheless, the smaller number we're dealing with, five notifications have gone in for SIs, and um, the ones we have intelligence to come are potentially in themselves challenging, so we rely very much on what is a UK legislative programme, what we're told about it. I can give the committee the assurance there is probing and interrogation and checking of what we're being told, making sure we get the full details. Um, and so we do whatever we can to try and preempt what's coming. So perhaps an example of that is the whole concept of retained EU law is being renamed assimilated law under the Rule Act. And so we're working on a Scottish statutory instrument, which will be laid in the coming weeks, potentially two, depending on how the drafting of that firms up the quality assurance process, which will refer to. But that really is to make sure the devolved statute book is timelessly updated for that change, which is coming as a result of a UK Act. Um, there's other work along those lines on the go, but certainly the retained EU lack is up there as uh, an ongoing UK implementation programme that we have to tune into as best we can and handle as best we can. And, and in those early notifications, certainly a number were in on time. Others we weren't able to for reasons explained in the notification because it is just so challenging to get that full and timely information. And we have to make sure the updates we're giving to committees are credible. Thank you for those answers. If I can follow up on that, um, I, I'd be interested to hear a little bit more, if you can, on the specific processes you have in terms of monitoring. Are you in the position that you're having to wait for the UK government to notify you of um, when things are being laid, or, or do you have channels through which you can monitor and, and follow the progress of, of work before it's, before you receive the formal notification? Um, and is there anything that you feel can be done to improve those processes so that we can avoid those um, kind of rush changes um, which we've seen in the past? To be perfectly honest with the answer is it's a bit of both. We have uh, officials working together all the time, as I've already said. You also have uh, the, the fact that when the UK government do make the announcement and they do go forward with it, the, as I've already said, it is their legislation. So we just need to make sure that we are kind of making them aware of the, uh, the Scottish element to it all. Could things be better? There's always room for improvement in absolutely everything in life. So yes, could we possibly find a way to uh, work uh, in a way where we can get things, make things a lot more smoother? But because of the technical uh, part aspects of a lot of this, it can become quite difficult. And the number of notes that I've seen flying back and forward between uh, both governments, I, I can see what, what these people end up having to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with regards to you know things that haven't been thought of that could have an, a problem. Like obviously, somebody's drafting something down in UK government. They are thinking purely from their perspective and how they're going to push things forward. And they may perceive there is no kick on to us up here. And one of the things that you do end up seeing is uh, the officials up in the Scottish government will say, "Well, that's not the case." And then there might be a wee bit of time of debate, a wee bit of to and fro, as to who actually is correct in that scenario. 
but it's back to the back to the accuracy of how we can provide that information to the committee and to the parliament to the best of our ability. But I'll bring in Stephen again if you just want to add something to that as well. Yeah, just briefly, I mean, there's, I think there's two main channels of communication. Um, so we, we operate in the centre of the Scottish Government and we've got some counterparts who operate in the, the centre of the UK Government on a sort of programme level. And I think retained EU law would be a good example of um, our request to them to give, give us a programme overview of what they think is coming over the next three to six months. But individual portfolios um, are also in touch with UK departments to understand uh, within that overall programme instruments of specific interest to them. So there is quite a lot of inform information sharing back and forward at official level. We do occasionally run into issues. I think the council tax uh, example of the summer is an example of that, where there probably is a little bit more work we can do to avoid that happening again in the future. And as I said, there is engagement taking place to try to make sure the UK government understands that we don't have the same in-year flexibility that they do. Thank you. When you say there's a little bit more work to be done to avoid that from taking place, what kind of work are you envisioning? What kind of improvements or changes do you see as necessary? I think it's partly educational. So, you know, Scottish government officials engaging with their UK counterparts. So UK understands the legislative um, framework up here and um, the time that's required for us to process any changes that they make when we need to make consequence changes up here in the Scottish Parliament scrutiny role. In most cases, that will be enough uh, to help us avoid um, mistakes happening again. If we didn't think it was, then we would escalate it to, to ministerial level so that uh, discussion could take place at that, um, between ministers. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Jeremy. Uh, good morning, Minister, and good morning to your team. Thank you for coming along this morning. Um, I wonder if I can just um, move this on. Your officials provide the committee and subject committees with a helpful weekly update of instruments to expand to be laid in the following two weeks. I wonder either yourself or your officials could indicate the anticipated volume of SSIs likely to be laid between now and maybe Christmas and who are likely to be the lead committees. And if you can't provide that today, perhaps you could drop a note to us. Basically, I know Mr Balfour's in mourning after the mighty St Martin Beatty's team on Saturday there, so, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm quite happy to answer the question. Uh, basically, we send a review to... This just last week, I sent an outline of what the legislative programme, when we expect everything to be, to the Bureau, uh, the Parliamentary Bureau. Now, that's all caveated. One, for the reason that uh, anything can happen in the in-between time to make sure that we, the, the, you know, between what we're programming at the moment and what ends up actually being reality. So uh, we obviously use that at Bureau as a strategic, we've got a strategic Bureau this week, where effectively we'll talk to, with other members of the Bureau to discuss how we go forward with that business programme uh, as it is. With committees, I tend to, as your convener will be aware, I tend to have one-to-ones with the conveners uh, with discussing the upcoming programme, what you have for the year, and uh, how we can deal with that. And that includes, and not so much in your committee, but other committees when we're taught discuss members' bills uh, and things like that as well. So on the whole, it's just trying to... Uh, if I was able to try and get you further detail a lot sooner, it would be... It's already out there with your business managers within the uh, Bureau as is, but at the end of the day that's caveated and I need to know basis with them because things can change. As we know, you know, things can change as Parliament goes through. So by the time we, when I, even when I'm talking to your convener and we're talking about some of the SLC bills and things, in fact, I'll give you a perfect example, uh, movable transactions. You know, I came here to committee in my first appearance and said uh, that was going to be your first SLC bill. It was going to be very good. Uh, it was going to come imminently. And uh, movable transactions became known to me as unmovable transactions bill because it was about six months or so before you actually got it because there was some difficulty to get us to a stage where we could bring it forward uh, for the committee to do it properly. So I only use that as an example. And not to go down the rabbit hole of SLC bills at this stage, but I only use that as an example of a time where I'm kind of, in all honesty, sitting here saying I can do that within that time scale, and uh, it doesn't become that way. So, you know, there's yes, when we can get you further information, we will. We engage regularly with your clerks and the committee as well, my officials and the officials of this uh, committee. So, quite happy to do that and keep that kind of flexibility open and that door open so that we can continue with that. But uh, for me to be able to give you anything long, long further term would be... Uh, I don't like to uh, kind of promise things that I can't deliver. 
and there might be a case where I might find myself in some cases in that position. Uh, OK, that uh, is helpful. Thank you, Minister. I, I suppose, then, you, the answer to this may be no, but if I can just push you a wee bit harder, particularly on larger and more complex SSIs, um, obviously, committees need as much notice because they are perhaps come as a large package of instruments and need more scrutiny. Um, do you know if any such instruments are likely to come forward or in the pipeline for, say, the next few months? If, if that tended to happen, I would probably have the conversation with your uh, convener when I have that one-to-one. -one. And from memory, I'm trying to remember, I don't think there was anything of uh, any significance for this committee. Uh, coming up uh, in the not too distant future, so because uh, I remember actually, I always use the lines uh, of the legislation that's coming through, kidding on every day that they're going to get all the legislation or uh, the SSIs as well, but just it's the full number. But on the whole, uh, I don't see anything for this committee, so I can guarantee you that at this stage, that's going from memory. I'll just confirm with uh, Stephen that that is indeed the case. Yeah, I mean, I think the volumes at the moment are reasonable. Um, I don't think we've got any really significant bits of legislation coming through the pipeline or really significant packages. Um, but if there was, we would be engaging with the clerks early. Um, I think over the years, that's something we've got, got better at, you know, understanding that the committee will want to understand packages of legislation so they know which instruments are linked together. And if the instruments are particularly large, then we understand that uh, the committee's legal advisers will need time to properly scrutinise them. So we do take all of that into account when we're planning. Yeah, I, I think there might be one large um, UKSI which needs to be laid in the Scottish Parliament um, in the next few weeks. I think in memory there's one which is 90 pages, which, um, which is a, it's a UKSI, but it's an actual one that needs to be laid in this Parliament rather than an SI notification. I think that's, that's the, the one I can think of. I'm just going to come in as a supplement. Is that the one that Mr Walker was talking about earlier on? Is that no, 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 this is something different. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll leave it there at a moment, Convener. Thank you. OK, well, thank you. And Bill Kidd. Thank you, uh, Convener. Minister, our predecessor committee um, welcomed the Scottish Government's work in meeting almost all of its historic commitments by the end of the last parliamentary session. Um, the longest standing commitment that still exists is now the Scotland Act 1998 Specification of Functions and Transfer of Property Order 2019. Now, following your last appearance in the committee, you confirmed, and in fact in your preambles, um, you confirmed that discussions go on, um, including on this, between the Scottish and UK governments. Any update on this specific um, matter um, that you can give us to ensure that it meets the commitment? Please. Rather than ra rather than ramble on, uh, Mr. Kidd, I'll just pass on to Stephen at this stage. Yeah. Um, again, I think um, we've, we've got better at dealing with historical commitments. Um, I remember being at this committee a number of years ago, when we had quite a large volume of outstanding commitments. We managed to drive that down to what is now, I think, four or five. Um, this one is the longest um, commitment. We were relying on the UK government to help us identify an appropriate Scotland Act order vehicle to get it done. We've not yet managed to do that, but it's certainly something we're continuing to discuss with them. And once we're able to identify a vehicle, we're happy to update the committee um, at that time. It's possible just to ask if there's why? I mean, without getting too deep into it, you know, is, is there something very specific about this one? It's, um, it's, there's an option, essentially, I think, whether to do a, a standalone instrument to deal with this issue or to do it as part of a wider instrument that's coming forward. Right. And I think everybody's preference would be to try to, to sweep it up as part of a, a wider instrument. And that's what we're trying to, to look for. If we can't, then I think we'll be in the territory of doing a standalone instrument to fix it. That's very fair. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. OK, thank you. And Oliver Mundell. Thank you, uh, Convener. I wanted to move on um, and ask about primary uh, legislation. Um, as the Minister will be aware, the recent programme for government uh, committed to introduce a bill on judicial factors. Uh, which would be based on a Scottish Law Commission report. Given part of the committee's remit is to look uh, at certain bills which are based on reports from the SLC, uh, can you give the committee an indication of what your current thinking is on the timescales of the bill and whether, in your view, it meets the bill criteria? Uh, currently, I've got no further detail on that at this stage. Uh, I can get back to the committee, Ms Mundell, uh, when as soon as we possibly can with uh, deep, further detail on that. 
Uh, that, that would be grateful. I think we'd also, um, given some of the previous issues, just appreciate uh, any background. You know, I'm appreciating what you're saying in terms of today that you could provide uh, on the work the Scottish Government has done, uh, given that it's some time since the consultation on that uh, publication took place, um, uh, and, and, and you know, and, and just you know to hear. You know, to, to hear what, what's been going on really in the background. You, you'll appreciate that, uh, in fact, uh, the SS, SLC bill that I made as an example, movable transactions, was another example of one that had been there for some time. And uh, we have to make sure we get ourselves into a place that, when I'm coming to committee, I'm, I'm actually quite wary about these things for the SLC, because that's a perfect example of uh, when I was sitting there with, uh, not to say anything about my official, Mr McGregor, who told me that uh, movable transactions was imminent. You know, and uh, I took him to his word and said it uh, in front of the committee. So you'll understand, Mr Mandel, when I'm a bit... Uh, I no longer want to commit myself to a stage having been through the process in this example. And I just want, for the very reasons that you've explained, uh, is one of the reasons I want to get the detail 100% and get back to you with what that actually is and how that looks. Yeah, that is helpful. I mean, I would push back a little bit and say you might have anticipated that the committee might ask about the bill today. Well, no, but no. I'm, I'm, I, I don't, you know, it's, it, it, I, all these bills are, are not particularly controversial when you start looking no. at them at the, the headline subject. I, but clearly, yeah, yeah. you know, with any legislation, whilst they're not politically controversial, you know, there are a lot of considerations within them and we'd want to be, you know, satisfied that yeah. the government's, you know, done that work behind the scenes to make sure... You know, the, the kind of consultation around the, the original proposal you know, is still relevant and, mm -hmm. and up to date because it will allow us to move much quicker and that's once part, the bill arrives. That, that's part of the reason, Mr Mundell, where I don't want to actually say something that I've not got uh, the full detail for you at this stage because I, I feel that that would set hairs running and, uh, as you say, it's not a highly political bill, but I just want to make sure this is right because my job is about process and I've got to make sure that I'm not the one that gets the process wrong. OK. Um, the the final question I wanted to ask was, was looking beyond that bill. Um, we are aware that the Minister for uh, Victims and Community Safety recently wrote to Lady Payton, uh, Chair of the SLC, committing Scottish Government officials to undertake, undertake detailed work on the following uh, SLC reports. The report on an approved scheme uh, for financial provision on cohabitation breakdown. Uh, the report on aspects of leases termination. Uh, and the report on the review of, of contract law. Um, and, and understand what you've said uh, to, to my colleague Jeremy Balfour before about not being able to look too far into the future. But we'd just be interested to hear your view um, you know, on, on, on whether you think those bills would be the sort of thing that, that might come to, to this, this committee um, you know, through, through the rest of the, this, this session. Yep, thank you for that. I'll just, uh, rather than repeat myself from previously, I'll get Stephen to maybe add something to this as well. Uh, yeah, uh, the Scottish Government gave a commitment a number of year, years ago to try and bring forward one bill in each of its legislative programmes which would be suitable for referral to this committee. As the Minister said, we think judicial factors will fit into that category this year. Um, the Scottish Government has not yet agreed the content of its year four and year five legislative programmes, but certainly those bills um, which you've mentioned, I think, are, are candidates for them. And we think at least two of them are probably suitable for referral to this committee. Yep. And there's still that firm commitment, I guess, back to the minister rather than, than yourself. But there's still that firm commitment to bring forward one, you know, in in, in years four and, and five. Yes, uh, that's part of the conversation I had with the convener when we had the one-to-one -one. earlier on. Was the fact that we still intend to do that, and more likely than not, uh, some of these LCL, uh, SCL, SLC bills will come to yourselves. Yeah. That, 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 that's, Again, that's with a very broad brush. No, that's, that's positive to hear because whilst no one ever wants to create more work for them, so I think these are important you know, areas that are often overlooked by the Parliament and would be. And I think I you think. bring up an important point that uh, in my time in this committee, we never had any legislation to do. And it was always really strange coming from other committees where you had a legislative programme to deal with. And I think uh, it's quite good for this committee, because of its remit, to get its teeth into uh, bills like this, which are very technical in aspects. And who better to do it than the members of this committee? Because everything you deal with day in, day out is highly technical. Okay, no, thank you. Um, Minister, um, You'll be aware that I've raised the issue regarding the Section 104 orders in the past. I raised it at a, a conveners group with the First Minister also. Uh, on also very much aware of the situation regarding the Mobile Transactions Scotland Bill and also the, uh, the Trust and Succession uh, Scotland Bill with the Stage 1 on Thursday. 
Um, certainly, can you uh, set out to the committee what the, the current processes are between the Scottish and UK governments to obtain and also implement a Section 104 order? Well, basically, we have the situation we've got to work with the UK government, as I've stated previously. Uh, again, it's coming from their side of things as well, so I've got to work around their processes. And it's quite funny because uh, when I come along to see yourselves, I'm often told that you know I must respect Parliament, give Parliament time to process uh, the, the detail. And that, that's what I've been trying to say with some of the answers earlier on as well. That becomes a difficult balancing act for us to actually get to a stage where we push the UK government enough to actually say we need to get the detail and we need to know what it is so that we can actually do the same with ourselves up here. And really, it's their process, and they have the ones that have the kind of they're, they're in control of that. So on the whole, it tends to be again officials will talk to officials. Uh, there will be times where it will kind of move up to ministerial level as well. Not at a meeting for a wee while, but I used to have meetings with regards to all of uh, these uh, kind of various sections of the Scotland Act uh, that we used to kind of deal with. And I remember having that meeting with my counterpart in the past. And the first meeting I had was listen, can we just leave the politics at the door? Because we are just talking about the function of how both parliaments can work together and deal with it. And my counterpart agreed with that because that's what we need to do in order to try and make this happen. And it's to give my officials and UK government officials the opportunity to have these conversations and to move that forward as well. I, I don't know who would be best to maybe give more detail on that. Would it be yourself, Stephen? Yeah, um, we engage quite regularly, official level, um, weekly, uh, as it happens, to discuss um, Scotland Act orders, which are currently in the programme and which might be coming up. Um, UK government has got its own rules of thumb about how long these things take to develop. <clears throat> we know what they are, so we take those into account when we're developing um, our programme. We also make clear to the UK government where we've got particular um, t uh, timing need um, to get legislation implemented, so they can take that into account. Um, occasionally, where it's uh, absolutely essential to speed it up, UK government have been willing um, to do that, and that engagement will, will continue to make sure that we, we let them know what we need um, as, as quickly as possible. Okay. So, no, it's a certainly, thank you for that. With, uh, with the Section 104 orders, um, now, one of the things that I suggested in the past uh, would be could there be some type of protocol put in place between both Scottish and UK governments to try to assist with these? Uh, because uh, with the Moveable Transactions Bill in particular, obviously now Act, um, we, we now have uh, an up-to-date Act apart from a section. Um, so that old legislation is still being utilised by practitioners in Scotland. Uh, and just by way of some feedback, um, any, uh, any practitioners I've spoken to uh, speak very highly of the Moveable Transactions Act, uh, and they're using it uh, on a daily basis. So it, it does clearly show that the SLC work uh, uh, does really benefit the, the legal process in Scotland. Uh, but in terms of the, come back to the Section 104 orders, um, is there a, or have you had any dialogue with the UK Government to try to formulate some type of mechanism or process whereby um, when a Section 104 order is required, that it's actually going to be a lot shorter as compared to the, the longer uh, drawn out process that we currently have? Because ultimately this is about making better law so practitioners can, can uh, utilise that to the benefit of, uh, of the, the country. Convener, I had a fair idea you'd probably ask uh, this question from the point of view that because of everything you've uh, stated there. The problem I have with it is that, be careful what you wish for, <coughs> uh, it may complicate matters even more and make things more difficult for us. I might be proven wrong in that, but my opinion is that this may make things a lot more difficult than what they currently are if we had some form of protocol there, depending on what that protocol was to do it. And I, I go back to the fact that this is basically coming from the UK government as well, so it's coming from their perspective. We would equally be quite defensive if it's some... Well, we are, as a government and as a parliament, quite defensive when it's our own stuff that our legislation that's going through or our own kind of uh, the work that we are doing so i do try at times to uh, consider uh, how things work for those that are in the other place because it's not all no matter how much i think it is but the world doesn't revolve around me and i am not that important in the whole kind of scheme of things and i think it is important that we kind of give them their space to be able to do what they have to do as well at times that can be challenging for us all 
But I, I really think we would have to be very careful with the idea of having some form of protocol. Now, maybe a protocol is maybe not the right uh, avenue to, to look at. But if there were, even if there was some type of kind of set of guidelines, uh, just to, to try to help to speed the process up. Because I, mean, I think the, from memory, I think it was put to us uh, that you'd be potentially looking up to well over a year, a year and a half, uh, for the Section 104 order to actually be dealt with. Now, um, it's, it's clear that it's not having a, a negative impact uh, upon the practitioners as such, but at the same time, it is actually uh, still having the aspect of an older part of legislation still being utilised for that specific element in comparison to the new legislation, which uh, people are very much welcome. No, I take on board everything you're saying, and I'm not looking... Uh, listen, if, as I've said to this committee on numerous occasions, I don't believe I've got a monopoly in good ideas. If someone comes up with an idea that will make something better and work uh, the way it should work, then fair enough, myself and my officials will look at that. But, uh, you know, I, I, the idea of a protocol still makes me a bit nervous because we are still currently managing to make it work to a certain degree just now. And it takes the time. The UK government would say to me, well, that's the time it takes. So work around it, you know. OK. OK, no, thank you, that Minister. Um, Jeremy Balfour. Yeah, um, thank you again. Um, I wonder if you can just move on slightly. I wonder what consideration does... The Scottish Government take into account when deciding to delegate a power or not in a bill and to satisfy itself that that's the appropriate way to do it. So I just wonder how do you work that one out? Are you talking about like the framework bills yes. and how yeah. you go about? Well, yeah. basically, uh, first and foremost, just so the committee is aware, I am not power mad and I am not making every bill a framework bill that's coming to Parliament. You've heard it here exclusively first. Uh, from myself, but uh, th the situation we have is there are certain times where that flexibility uh, helps the bill and gives us the option to be able to uh, deal with that uh, further down the line and be able to deal with stakeholders to help co-design certain bills as well. So, uh, on the whole, uh, it's not a, we are not routinely going down to that stage to actually decide that we're going to have framework bills, but it's uh, it's mainly there for us to offer the flexibility that we can have. I don't know if Stephen wants to add anything to that as well. I might pass this more over to Rachel, um, if she wants to. I mean, yes, in, in each um, bill, we would consider the powers on a case-by-case -case basis. Is Can we justify the power as well as being able to um, justify it internally? We know that um, we will need to be able to justify it to the Parliament and that it will be scrutinised by the Parliament, including by yourselves, and there will need to be a good reason for it. Um, there can be different reasons for different powers, but um, yeah, we consider each one on a case-by-case -case basis rather than having a particular preference um, to take powers. And without coming too philosophical, do you think there's been a change, both within Scottish Government and actually Westminster, to use framework bills more often than, say, 20, 30 years ago? And if so, is that a deliberate policy decision or is it just something that has evolved over time? I can't really talk about 20 or 30 years ago because I think I was in <laughs> primary school, at least 30 years ago anyway. Uh, but, uh, no, I'm lying, actually. I'm forgetting I'm getting older. <laughs> so, but uh, basically, I, I can't talk for the past, but now it's exactly what Rachel has said. It's done by a case-by-case -case basis. It's where we can make the justification as to the reason why we're doing this and uh, why we see it as important. And in many cases, it is to try and design, especially when it's a bill that would possibly uh, actually... Stakeholders need to have a really kind of important part of the role as uh, the bill as well. But in other cases, it might be give us that added flexibility that we need to be able to deliver what we want to deliver. But on the whole, it's not uh, our go-to place. It's not our kind of original idea to try and create a bill as to automatically go to a framework bill. Okay, then just to come right up to the future in regard to the program of government that was announced just a few weeks ago. Uh, what balance has been taken in regard to what we just talked about, in regard to the present bills that are about to come forward? OK, so it's Rachel again, after Stephen this time. I'm happy to start. Um, I mean, I think out of the, the programme that's been announced, um, 
I mean, I can't think of any. I can't think of a significant number of bills with that we class as framework potentially agriculture for the, the flexibility is required for the future to enable um, the powers to be used. Um, but justification will be given for why we think that's that's the case. Um, in terms of trends, and the, the last question, uh, the last question asked. I mean, I. I would agree with the Minister. I don't think there's been any trend really over the last <coughs> 10 to 20 years for more framework bills. We, we look at all these things internally before they come to the Scottish Parliament. Perhaps with things like Social Security, where there's been new powers, um, that sort of topic has lent itself more to the requirement for, um, for framework type bills. But again, where that's been required, I think the Scottish Government understands that it will require to justify and explain uh, why it was appropriate. And ironically, you and I, Jeremy, were actually on. Uh, you and I, Jeremy, were actually on the Social Security Committee when that went through, uh, and uh, we—I don't remember the framework part of the bill being the biggest issue that we were dealing with at that stage. Uh, but the actual—it it was more the actual policy part of that we had the discussion on. And for me, that's the most important thing. It's not the—it's not actually how the bill is presented. It's how this place in the Parliament uh, actually scrutinises the policy part of it as well. Yeah, and the, and the social security legislation in the UK Parliament has been sort of framework based for sort of 30 years. So that again is not a new trend. That is something that 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 is the way the sort of social security legislation has developed to allow for flexibility to meet you know, changing circumstances and you know um, deal de deal with, with with things as they arise. Yeah. Uh, I'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you. Alder Mandel? Yeah. I, I, I wanted to push a bit further on the frameworks point. Um, you know, I, I think, obviously, it gives ministers and the government increased flexibility, but the parliament also loses something in the process. You know, and I know there's always a trade-off between the parliament and government. I, I, I do accept that. But you know, as, as an individual member of the parliament, you know, when I see the likes of the uh, new agricultural bill coming forward, you know, I, I do worry about my ability to influence it on behalf of my constituents, because clearly, if everything is in secondary legislation, the chance to actually put down amendments and have them voted on and have a, a transparent, uh, you know, a transparent debate and process is, is quite limited. Um, and it also, um, I think, you know, sort of changes the changes the nature of the kind of debate and, and, and negotiation around what, what our, our policy looks like and that you know that that's just one example um, you know the, the committee or a majority of members of the committee had the same view in relation to the national care service um, and I, you know I would just ask you you know what, what, what your reflection on that is as a parliamentarian yourself no well having worked with yourself Ms Mantel since 2016 uh, you're, you're not exactly quiet when it comes to stating your opinion and I think that's the whole point of parliament in itself when you can express the opinion you just expressed there which is effectively you think there is a I would still go back to the fact that there's always this debate with framework bills where effectively uh, some see it as a power grab by uh, the government itself and others see it as uh, well, we see it as a way of just being creating the flexibility and designing service social security being an example of that design a service for stakeholders to make sure you deliver for the actual what you set out to do in that policy with agriculture I, I would assume that that would be a case of working again with the stakeholders there as well to make sure there's no point in having an agricultural bill when you've not had full engagement with and uh, there's, there's some element of co-design uh, with the bill itself as well and given the flexibility to be able to make sure it works because at the end of the day an agriculture bill you'll probably know more about this Mr Mandel than me but it affects people's livelihoods and uh, how they go about their business as well so I would say uh, that uh, you know, it still gives us the framework. I understand. You, you do, do recognise the point. I do recognise there is this debate. Can't amend the legislation, yes. and it limits the scope for amending legislation when the details held back. I recognise. I recognise that debate that's happening in Parliament, and I understand that. But what I'm trying to say is, uh, I think at the end of the day, it's actually about delivery. Or from my purview, uh, point of view, it's about to be able to deliver what we actually wanted to do in the bill. And mm -hmm. it's not a case of taking anything away from Parliament. For yeah. me, but I understand... But I, it takes something away from my constituents. Clearly, 
they, you know, not to get into the kind of politics of it, uh -huh. but and it would be the same for for other members from different no. parties, and the same for your MPs, you know, or MPs of who, who, who represent the SNP in, in the UK Parliament, and you can kind of go round. You know, it's, it's not it's not that point, but there are there are parts of the country, you know, where where people didn't put their trust in the government, and their elected representatives in this Parliament, because of the decision to go down the framework route, mm. don't have the option, you know, don't have the option to make amendments, uh, and that you know, and, and to show you know, to to show people what the alternatives were, you know, and, and to see the Parliament as a whole vote on those. At the end of the day, Ms Mundell, you've made your point of view. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with your point of view because I've already stated how I believe uh, the bill goes forward. It's an ongoing debate we'll have. The good news <coughs> is it is not, uh, when I answered Mr Balfour's uh, question, it's not something we're doing all the time. It's not our go-to place for, let, there's a framework bill, let's just uh, can I hang everything on that. We don't do that. It's on a bill-by-bill -bill basis. And if, that, if I can assure you in any point of view that that is how we look at it, uh, I take on board your opinion and uh, I'll maybe have a discussion with my officials with regards to that. Uh, but on the whole, we try to make sure that there's as much uh, scope for the Scottish Parliament to scrutinise legislation as possible. Thank you. And Bill Kitt. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Minister, there's been an increase in the frequency of LCMs and supplementary LCMs uh, coming to the committee, and there's often a fairly tight turnaround in, uh, in terms of time for consideration. Uh, the committee notes the timings of LCMs are influenced by a number of factors, including some out with the power of the Scottish Government. Um, but what could the Scottish Government do to allow greater parliamentary scrutiny of these LCMs? Could you, for example, um, ask or push for supplementary LCMs to be lodged sooner after amendments are lodged so that we've got more time to... Yeah, this is always an ongoing debate that we've had, I think, since the first day I, I sat in front of this committee, and it probably was happening before I, I became Minister for Parliamentary Business. Again, we're back to a situation where the UK government will do a uh, piece of legislation. They'll believe that there isn't a Scottish element to it. Officials may say, well, my side may say there is a Scottish element to it. Uh, there'll be a bit of toing and froing at that stage. But the other problem we have is we're receiving the LCMs literally, if lucky, an hour before the actual press release goes out talking about, or sorry, we're, leave, we're receiving the information an hour before uh, the actual uh, press release goes out regarding a bill. And that makes it quite challenging for us because we can't, we've got to then get officials to, in order to justify whether there is going to be an LCM, there's not going to be an LCM, or we're going to, the LCM are going to be for it, or we're going to be against it. We've got to make that, and we've got to have a case and justification for that. Now, that takes time for us to do it. If we got our uh, information a wee bit quicker, then uh, we, it would be a, a lot easier for us to do that, to give the Parliament more time as well, in order to uh, scrutinise the legislation as well. And I remind everybody the King's speech is just round the corner. So we could end up with a situation, who knows what's going to be in that as well. So there could be more of that. But official level, again, we have officials with UK government and Scottish government talking to each other all the time, trying to make uh, this work. I've actually asked officials myself, because I've got to the stage where I, I hear your arguments, I hear what you're all saying uh, with regards to LCMs, and I keep asking, you know, has this always been like this? Has this always been the case uh, since the evolution began? And I've been told to a lesser degree in the past, but it was always an issue. But to a lesser degree, it seems to have become more prevalent now. Now, how that, why we aren't getting told sooner, why things are getting left to the last minute, why there's a belief that there isn't a Scottish element to some of the things. Like some of the, sometimes uh, we'll have discussions, officials will have discussions at official level where they'll say they'll quite blankly say this does not affect you in any shape or form and that argument could go on for quite a while as well and while they're trying to uh, discuss that so i don't know if it's a political element uh, possibly creeping in from westminster i'm not sure uh, but uh, official level we're trying all we can uh, and at ministerial level can i assure you that when i talk to my counterparts i'm trying to make sure that we make this work a lot easier uh, but for some reason we seem to literally be getting things an hour before the press release goes out well, that's helpful for us to know. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um,
Do members have any other questions for the Minister and his team? No. Okay. okay. Minister, I'd like to thank you and your colleagues for uh, coming to the committee this morning. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, if there are any particular points that we, uh, we may have a discussion later on, any points we may write to you. But with that, I will suspend uh, the meeting to allow the Minister and his team to leave. Thank you. Under agenda item number three, we are considering seven instruments subject to the affirmative procedure. No points have been raised on the following draft instruments. The Real Aid, Legal Aid and Advice and Assistance, Miscellaneous Amendment, Scotland number four, Regulations 2023. The Transport Scotland Act 2019, Amendment Regulations 2023. The Real Aid, Carers Assistance, Carers Support Payment, Scotland Regulations 2023. The International Organisations, Immunities and Privileges, Scotland, Amendment No. 2, Order 2023. The Coronavirus Recovery and Reform, Scotland Act 2022, Extension and Expiry of Temporary Justice Measures, Regulations 2023. 
and the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Trading Scheme, Amendment No. 2, Order 2023. Is the Committee content with these instruments? Yeah. Yes. Under Agenda Item No. 4, we are considering three instruments subject to the negative procedure. No points have been raised on SSI's 2023, 249 and 258, and SI 2023, 995. Is the Committee content with these instruments? Under Agenda Item No. 5, we are considering an instrument not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised on SSI 2023-262. Is the Committee content with this instrument? Thank you. And with that, I will move the Committee into private.